can do that next Wednesday. I guess so. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. We have a uh, a lot to uh, talk about. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah. So, are you uh, are you standing I'm, in for Kelly? I am standing in for Kelly. Hold on. Um, one one Zoom question I have. I posted the update in the uh, chat mm -hmm. uh, right when I joined, but there was nobody else in the room at the time. Does everybody else that joins after me see it, uh, or do I need to? Post no, it? they won't. They won't. Such a lame uh, yeah. Zoom feature. Yeah, okay. that's it's I, not a good feature. All right, let me just let me do that really quick, just so that I. Uh, Oh, uh, looks like Christian might have uh, reposted it. So we're good. Okay. Let's get started then. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, just as a heads up, if uh, this voice uh, doesn't sound familiar, this is Chris Boscolo. I am standing in for Kelly. Uh, she is um, at a, one of her kids' uh, graduation, so she couldn't make it. Um, but it's important that uh, I give this update, uh, tech update periodically, just to remind us how fortunate we are to have Kelly on our team. So uh, you'll have to uh, put up with me for this, for this time around. I'm gonna give the highlights, the, uh, the um, update, to um, 74 is in on the wiki. So if you want to follow along there, you can. Um, and definitely, if you want to drill in on any details, uh, I suggest you do that um, so that you can uh, get all of the, the deep background information. But I want to cover the important stuff. Um, you your oh, my goodness. You know what? Um, I am not in a position to share my screen. Is um, either greg i don't know if you could pop it up really quick on yours or i know pavel is going to do a presentation so pavel um maybe if you wouldn't mind just popping up the uh community update page right before your we switch to your presentation yeah that's can... a that's a great idea well if you could just yeah do that now and then switch over to the other person because i'm on my phone right now okay can you do that pavel yes could you send me the link yeah, no, it's, it's in actually in chat. If you go into the chat room, uh, you'll yeah. see it. Oh, let me share my screen. Oh, you cannot share the screen. Yep. Thanks, Christian. Okay. Uh, so um, let's get rolling then. So a couple of highlights. As as I said, I, I invite you to to actually click that link yourself and drill in on the details for anything. Um, but we released 0 0.9.5. This is the release that has the R space renovation um, and also some R node uh, optimizations. Um, and then another uh, key thing for those of you that are using uh, R node at the command line is that you have the ability to generate key pairs in this release, um, which is that big uh, usability improvement. On the heels of 095, we did also just release 096 today. Um, and the reason we did that is it provided a fix to a bug that was found during community testing that was hampering uh, maintenance and um, our public testnet and de development testnet. So that was uh, bug 3450, if you want a little bit more information on that. Um, so that gave us an opportunity to collect a few more tickets into 0 0.9.6 that I, I wanna focus in and highlight um, because they're kind of important. Uh, first of all, with the 0 0.96, uh, we, with that key gen feature, you need to specify the algorithm um, when you're doing key gen. So that's uh, one thing you need to pay attention to. Um, the other thing that we added with 0 0.96 is that you can do registry lookups using human readable names uh, for the system contracts or the BLESS contracts instead of the URI lookups. Um, so for example, the Rev Vault, you can, you can do a registry lookup uh, with the name Rev Vault. Um, and this, this is important um, 
feature when I get um, talking about, well, I'll just move right into it for the work that we're starting on, on uh, um, that started on May 27th for this sprint. Um, we're starting to uh, work on some tickets that are one of those tickets is to migrate our all of our uh, use of public key crypto from uh, Ed 25519 to SEP26K1 just so that it's easier for everybody to only have to deal with one encryption algorithm or uh, public key encryption algorithm that is, um, but that we can use them for all of our wallet uh, signing and whatnot. The important thing about that upgrade is that the all of the URIs for the contracts that are currently running in testnet will get updated for all of the system contracts. So that's why it's really important um, for you as a stepping stone to move over to those named uh, contracts because then um, you won't be affected by the change over to the URI to the new URIs for each one of those contracts. When we release the code with the new contracts, the names will map to the new contracts and you won't have to worry about it. So uh, that's a really important part of uh, the release that, that, or the work that's going on now and the release we just did. So um, in addition to that, I just wanna kind of uh, walk through some of the um, other highlights um, for, so uh, on the consensus side, um, we're starting the work um, to do bonding and unbonding. So that's uh, a lot of that consensus work, um, is, we are in the heart of it. So uh, really awesome to see uh, the dev team making good progress on that. Um, the, hold on just a second, I got to flip to my notes that I took while I was preparing to be Kelly today. Um, and then we're also, uh, we'll be finishing up removing uh, the deprecated old proof of state contract from the code base. So those, that's the work on that I want to highlight on consensus. Um, for the node work, uh, we just we did some metric improvements to support uh, investigating some consensus consensus bugs, and work started this week. Um, actually, the PR is already in, but we're introducing the ability for uh, users of our node client to uh, keep their private keys in an encrypted file and use them by uh, starting our node client and giving it the password for that encrypted file. And the advantage to this is that um, you don't have to pass the private keys any longer on the command line. That command line feature will remain there. Um, so we're removing it from the, the documentation so you won't be able to see it. But for all of the existing code and tests that are using that command line feature to pass in the private keys on the command line, they'll continue to work so that won't break but um, we're moving toward uh, a process where um, users will have to use the uh, private keys that are in the encrypted file. And this is just uh, to have good, you know, crypto client hygiene. So we're not all, uh, basically being uh, nonchalant about these private keys and they're always um, stored somewhere secure. Um, in addition to that, um, we will, uh, provide the ability for you, for the server implementation of, of when you run our node as a server to provide that key through an environment variable. Um, and we also will be working on, in the future, not, uh, not currently part of this, this week's sprints, but uh, making it a little bit easier for you to do that with key management systems that are in place, like in the cloud environments and AWS and Azure and whatnot. Okay. Um, any questions on that so far before I keep going down? Because that, that part of it I want to make sure is clear for everyone. Yeah, so I have a question about uh, one of the bugs. I don't know if you mentioned it here or if it's in the next section, but bug 3433. Apparently that's blocking the wallet work that Ed is doing. Um, can I cover that at the end? Let's see. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to hold on just a second.
three four three three. I so I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one, Greg, because I'm not I'm not in the know on this particular bug. I've I haven't looked at it yet at all. Okay, no worries, no problem. Okay. Any other questions on any of that? So uh, for Rolang, um, we're continuing the work to bridge the cost accounting and the wallet. Um, uh, that progress is uh, um, continuing. Um, we're also implementing the uh, deployer ID that we discussed a few updates ago. Um, so that the uh, the signer of the deploy can do things like wallet spends, and we can make sure that that um, isn't possible to be done by contracts um, that you call into. So uh, all of that deployer ID work is in progress. Um, with uh, our space, I'd, I mentioned that we. Uh, uh, have the renovated R space that's in uh, 0 0.5.6. Um, also that we had fixed uh, bug 3450 that we found uh, during testing. Um, we're also, prog um, there's also work uh, in progress as a, to do as an alternate way for um, uh, show blocks. And um, in addition to that, um, we're adding the ability for you to look up the, when you do it, we call it deployer ID um, for other chain, other blockchains, we think of these as transactions. Um, when you deploy your code to the chain, we're gonna uh, simplify the ability to look up that deployment by ID. So that work is underway. Um, it's, uh, man. On the SRE side, uh, we've got, um, there's a link in the community update uh, to the to the chain hardening. Um, so we've got work in prog progress to complete um, uh, one of the hard hardening tests. Um, and for the list of those, you can see that link as well. I'm gonna make sure that that's the main stuff. Um, Yeah, I think that's that's most of uh, what we have for updates. Any questions? I thought that was good, uh, hey, good summary. Thank you. Obviously never as good as when Kelly gives it. She's a uh, far more command of all of the details. Um, regarding uh, our chain or uh, ticket 34, did you say 3433, Greg? That's that's right. That's what was reported right, to me take, as a blocker. I'll take a look at that um, while uh, I want to invite Pavel to um, uh, do his, uh, he's going to give a, a update or a presentation on TLA that he did to the dev team last week. Um, so I'm going to hand the, the mic over to him. While he's doing that, I'll investigate that one, Greg, and uh, try to give an update right after he's done. Sounds good. Pavel, are you ready? Yes. And I, I need everybody can hear me. Yep. Hello. hello. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah, you're right. good. Awesome. I'll try to share my screen right now. By the way, I was kicked out from my co-working space right now. So I, I know this guy try quickly. There's no, not too much background noise for you guys. I try to do my best. All right, so so before we before we quickly go to PLA, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if everybody is aware of how like node transitions from one state to another. So I'm gonna quickly just jump over this little diagram here uh, that shows how the node operates when it boots up. So if the node is an existing network, it's up in the state called new, and then it sends to a bootstrap a message um, that is called um, uh, approved block request, and it immediately transitions to the, the, this called, the state called init, in, in which it waits until a bootstrap sends it in an approved block. Upon receiving that block, it goes to a running state. Now, this is a scenario where you already have a running network. What happens if you want, if you have, if you have if we have a ceremony, Genesis ceremony, on that this is a completely different story. We have two actors, a ceremony master 
and Genesis validators, Ceremon Master sends an approved block to Genesis validators. Upon receiving, upon receiving an approved block, the Genesis validator sends the block approval and transitions to init, then waits for uh, uh, approved block from the Ceremon Master. And once Ceremon Master gets enough signatures, it sends the approved block to Genesis validators and transitions to running, and also Genesis validator transitions to running as well. So that's pretty much in a nutshell how, how that state transitions happens and how we're receiving different messages in the system. Also, uh, before we go into TLA stuff, it's worth noticing how communication layer works within the node itself. Uh, so this kind of represents the node. Node has two abilities to send messages. It can stream messages, and the way it does that, so if you have a message that you'd like to send to the network, what, what you normally do is you create that message such store it in the file system and insert that information that you would like to send this particular message, for example, a block on the queue. Uh, the queue is uh, first in, first out. So uh, there, there are consumers who will take your message and they will send that over the network to the other node, which upon receiving it, it will store this on the file system and also will store uh, this little information on the, on, the, on the incoming queue. And then this message is consumed and the block, whatever the message was, is being processed by the system. We also have an API, uh, a separate API that we use for, for sending. So whenever you have so whenever you have a message that is really, really small and you don't really need to uh, stream it, you can send it uh, over the synchronous uh, call. The way it works is that the node tries to send synchronously this message if the message fails to be delivered, sorry, the message fails to be delivered, it disappears. If it happens to be delivered, the user will be notified. So that's really quickly about how uh, overall structure of messages being sent and how that relates to underlying infrastructure. Now, we can now try to specify all that I just described in this language called TLA plus. So TLA plus is a, is a language that allows specifying distributed algorithms. It's a language that allows only specification in, in general terms. So there's not there's no correlation, there's no relation to code itself. You can generate code from specification. It only allows you to write a spec of a general distributed algorithm. And it also has something called a model checker, which will run a brute force against your specification, checking different different uh, uh, corner areas of your of your algorithm and look if all the properties and all, if all the environments of the temporal formula, formulas hold. So just going really quickly, this is the specification as it is uh, for the Casper as it is implemented today. So we will recognize there's a list of nodes. Each node has a status, has that incoming list of incoming messages, also has that list of outgoing messages that are going to be streamed, and also this ability to send a message in a synchronous manner. Now, if we go to the very bottom of that specification, uh, you will, so this is, I will not cover everything for that like specification, just really quickly, I'll let you know that, you know, when we start the network, uh, when we start this uh, model checker, um, we see that we initialize some statuses, the incoming queues and the outgoing queues and the, um, the important part is, 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 is this. So this is the, this is the property, the temporal property that we would like to check for our systems so TLA, stands from uh, temporal logic of actions. It means we can not only check invariants that, but we can also check properties that hold over time. So those, th those two little signs, this, this almost looks like a, a Unicode didn't load it up in the PDF, but actually this, is, this means something. So this little character means eventually, and this square, so then the diamond means eventually, and square means always. So here we're reading that eventually always for all nodes that are in the system, their status should be run. So we hope that no matter what happens, no matter how the algorithm will execute, no matter which corner so it, it will find it, it will always be a case that eventually all nodes receive the status running, regardless if they're joining the network of we, if we have a Genesis ceremony. So here we have different, uh, I'll, I'll not go to all elements of the still expect because we don't have time for it. But it's worth noticing that if you have at least some understanding of how nodes operate internally, uh, you will re recognize cases that are, are familiar. So for example, uh, we will see that um, if, if, we are, uh, if we are a ceremony, if we are a ceremony master, uh, we, are, we basically wait for messages, messages which are of type block approval, which are being sent to us from uh, Genesis validators 
for all other types of messages like a food block or a food block request, we do not we simply do not handle them. Uh, the same thing, like for example, for Genesis validator, the Genesis validator only waits uh, for unapproved block message. Uh, upon receiving it, it sends a new block approval to the sender, meaning to the ceremony master. All other messages are not being handled, and so on. So for every type of message that's being by the system is being described here in this sort of mathematical way of describing uh, the algorithm. Now, this is just a specification, but the uh, nice thing about the like class is that model tracker. So if you see here, you will see that. I can just, I need that soon. All right, so, so um, let me, um, I'm sorry, I was not prepared. And now I am. Okay. So having that, having that spec, we can now run the model checker. So an example of the model that we can create is following. For the given specification, we prepare a model in which we create a list of three nodes. So here this model represents that we have three nodes with an ID R1, R2, and N1. Both R1 and R2 are in state running already. So this is an existing network that's running. R1 is a bootstrap. R2 has a point to bootstrap. So it looks like it was initialized with, with R1 as a bootstrap. And we have this new node that just tries to join the network. And, and having just that, we can now uh, run this model. So we will say those are the, proper, the properties that we are trying to check. So as a reminder, the temporal property that we're trying to check is eventually all nodes are running. Uh, there's something in the chat. I, so I don't see it. Um, but anyway, um, and, and now if we if we just call this button run, what that will happen is model checker is will parse our specification and will run a brute force trying to under, trying to look for all the possible corner cases that may happen. And it it now eventually found very quickly a, a scenario in which our system is stuttering, meaning that it's not progressing, the algorithm is not moving forward. And that's a very simple set of steps. So we start with our uh, with our network where we have two nodes running. Oh, sorry, weird stuff is happening too. Zoom. Hope you guys still can hear me. Um, so we start with two nodes which are running and the one that is new. Uh, the one that is new is, is launching the network and is sending a message. Uh, but that that to so the launch of the network sends a message at loop block requests. Unfortunately, that message is being lost because I haven't showed you that. But within that spec, maybe I can show it really quickly. Within that spec, we also model we also we model two two different scenarios that can happen to this uh, to the message. The message can be transferred, but also the message can be can be lost because we are running in this sort of environment, and this is not this is a, a, a thing that potentially might happen, especially when we call where we stream messages, so we're sending values in a synchronous matter. So when we when that happens and we, we send a message approved work request upon, upon running the node and that message is being lost, uh, uh, we um, and uh, we we file them to send that message and nothing ever happens. And that's that's the state of the system as it is right now. Obviously there is a, an easy way how we how we could fix that. So so we got the fix. Uh, sound is not really good. Oh, I understand. Um, I'm sorry. I tried to speak slower. Sorry, apologies. I ju will just say that I only will have 10 minutes. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm going really, really fast. But the fix for it, the fix for this problem, let me scroll really quickly. The fix for this issue is following. Uh, previously, upon upon receiving, upon trying to send a approved block request, upon to try to send this. And if we failed, uh, we previously were not doing anything. Now we try to resend that message and we are keep on trying to resend that new approved block request until we transition to the running state. So if we do, if we do just that, if we if we do just that and I have to I have to switch to a fix. So we are now going to a version of TLA which fixes this issue. This is not a fix that's already have in the code itself. But if we do that, we can run the model and, and now we will learn after a few seconds, hopefully. Well, hopefully. 
keep on running. So it, it, it takes a while for the model checker to check for all the cases, but essentially we get information back that everything is okay. So at least at, at from the specification perspective, we know that joining a new network, existing network works correctly after that one single check. So I will be, because my audio is crappy currently, I will be not following this rest of the, of the TLX spec, but there's another model I call Genesis Ceremony, which, which has a, a different, different initial values. So in that example, I have one Ceremony Master. So this is a node, which is a Ceremony Master. It also happens to be bootstrap for this validator called uh, GV1, which is an initial status Genesis validator and CM, it's bootstrap, and if we if we run it right now, um, we will learn that uh, there actually is an an error in our uh, genesis ceremony as it is implemented today. And um, so I will not be following it, but you guys can see hopefully that there is sequence of eleven steps upon which this says goes back to state. Uh, to state five. It means that there is a scenario, there is a partner case in Genesis ceremony where we will not reach, uh, where we will not reach the ceremony itself. So we'll not reach all the nodes being in state running and they will just be infinitely uh, sending messages to, it, to each other and never really respond to them. And also for that particular issue, there's also already a fix which is ready. So I, I have a fix for that. The, the fix is straightforward. Unfortunately, I have, I have a connectivity issue, so I will not go into details. If, if anybody is interested, I, I can only, I can do that, but maybe not necessarily today. But the but the fix is straightforward within the within the spec, and if we if we now apply that fix, if we now apply that fix, then uh, after after applying this fix, if we run the model, uh, everything works correctly. So this will take a, a little bit of time eventually reaches out uh, a situation where every note in every possible scenario uh, ends up in the running state. So that's, uh, that's all for me. Um, well, so thank you. Thank you, Pavel. That was, that was a great presentation. And as I, as I mentioned on the, the, the dev setup where you, where you demo this, it's kind of the, the best advertisement for behavioral types um, because uh, the, you know, first of all, it shows that the, the um, uh, just so the people who are not in the know understand the temporal formulae that you uh, showed. Those are basically the shape of the behavioral types that we'll be providing um, in the next phase of rolling. But the main difference between that development methodology and the one that you're following currently is that the model has no relationship to the actual running code, except in the mind of some human being or some group of developers who are relating the model to the actual running code. And so if they make any kind of mistake in their relationship of the model to the actual running code, then even though the model might be proven correct, or you might find a bug in the model, neither of those things may hold uh, uh, faithfully of the, the running code unless there's some, uh, some automatic way to relate the two. And what the behavioral types do is to um, make the, the actual running code be the model. Um, and then you model check that code against uh, the types which are now uh, correlated to specifications which relate to security properties and concurrency properties such as liveness properties um, and uh, other kinds of things. So uh, I, I think what you're showing is, first of all, it's really hard to develop <laughs> distributed systems. And we yeah, really... I, I'm saying like, definitely like the behavioral types would be a game changer at that point. So yeah, I like, my absolutely. Fingers. No, no, this is, this is, and so I, I just, I love the presentation. The other, the other thing that people might be interested in, here I'll do a quick screen share. Um, Hang on, I have to join from a different device. Where can we find uh, uh, links to the uh, the tool and the uh, specification? So specification will be available on GitHub. 
Uh, just the text file, you will have to generate PDF on your own, but that's a, it's just a straightforward, you just download to and it will generate the PDF for you. Or I can I can also upload the text text file LaTeX LaTeX and if you if you can generate PDF from that. Just if you throw a link into the Casper channel, that would be great. Awesome. And then the the, the the other thing that people might be interested in is that there's there's not just one model checker. Um, there are lots of different kinds of model checkers. TLA is a particular has a particular flavor and a particular model of concurrency. But if you're interested in a model checker that's much closer to our behavioral types, let me recommend the spatial logic model checker. Um, so this is the our our type system is very close to um, the formulae uh, that uh, correspond to the spatial logic um, formulae. And if you look uh, here are examples um, of uh, building the models and <coughs> building the properties. So these are the types, these are the models. In this case, these, the, the models correspond almost exactly now to the Rolang syntax. It's very, very close uh, in nature. Instead of a question mark here, you'd have a four comprehension. But apart from that, they are the same. Def proc equals is, is contract. And they are more or less the same. And here we have uh, exactly the same kind of thing. So you have this, um, uh, but, but you can, ex you can express uh, other kinds of things that you can't express in TLA, uh, such as locality. Right, so with with spatial with spatial systems, you can detect when a system is divided into multiple uh, autonomous components. That's not something you can do with TLA, but you can with a with a spatial formulae. And so you can then write down formulae like um, uh, everybody eventually gets to know. Uh, so and and that has to do uh, with with the, the spread of information throughout autonomous regions of the network, which is an important security property. Another interesting um, security property uh, uh, is established, a much more interesting one, is the Arrow uh, Distributed Directory Protocol. So here's a, here's a um, uh, this comes from uh, the, the Arrow um, uh, protocol that was designed, oh my gosh, by Herlihy. Uh, and Demmer uh, back in '98, so it's a uh, much more sophisticated protocol. But you can you can see that they're able to prove things like deadlock free, right? So they're able. So in addition to the security properties, we have liveness properties that are available here, and <clears throat> these are the kinds of things that we'll be offering directly on running code in uh, Rolang in the next iteration of Rolang. So I'm, I'm very excited uh, uh, that we're, we're getting to the point now where um, we're, you know, at the dog food level, we're showing that our code needs this kind of support <laughs> um, and that eventually we'll be making this available to every single, uh, uh, go ahead, Pavel. If I, if I may add to it, it's like, for, from what I understand, what I've learned about formal verification methods right now is that you basically end up in two different roles. One is where you verify correctness of your code, but that require, requires at the given state of formal, formal verification tools this many years of PhD knowledge and all that. On the other hand, you have a TLA, which is, I would, I would say, pretty easy to use and pretty easy to, uh, to understand, but then you have this gap. Between, between what you design to specify and the code that will eventually be representing that algorithm. So having things like that, what you mentioned, I guess would be a game changer and potentially making formal methods more available to, to a, a typical uh, engineer or developer. That's exactly it. That is the whole idea, is, is you, you make the formal methods available directly to the end, the end user developer, the person, the person who's, who's writing smart contracts on a daily basis. That's what they do. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you put it into the mix in such a way that their workflow is not disrupted. The other, the other issue, as, as you may have seen with, with, with Pavel, is he's ha he has to go back and forth between his actual code and the build system and the compile system and all of that associated with the actual code and the model checker 
system, which has its own build and its own uh, 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 execution mechanism, et cetera, right? And so as every developer will tell you, every flow interruption <laughs> is exceptionally costly. Um, so if you can just, if, if you can put the, um, the formal methods into the build part of your system, i.e. the type checking, then, then you, you've, you've, you've mapped it into a natural place in their development methodology. And so this, this has huge wins, uh, both in terms of, of productivity, uh, but also in terms of adoption. So yeah, so I, I, I'm very excited about your presentation, Pavel. I think it's really, really awesome. Thank you so hey. much. Go ahead. Thanks, thanks Pavel. Greg, if you're ready to move on, I just want to give a just final bit of update on the things you question you had a question about. Yes, please. Yeah. So, um, I, 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 there, Ed has given an update. Uh, he actually did this uh, in Discord um, that he is not seeing that problem anymore. But we haven't done anything to fix it, so it's very likely that there's a, a hidden bug that we were we may run into again on that issue. Um, at his last update as of this morning that is that he's not seeing it though. So uh, the the quick update is um, we don't know why it came and went, uh, which means it very possibly is still there. I hate that. <laughs> yes. I'm, yeah, I know. I know. I just, I also want to clear, I don't know if I was super clear on the Rolang chains that we're making, um, but uh, basically one of the user um, challenges we have is finding your deploy after you've deployed it um, because you have to use show block and give it the block number. So we're, we're changing that so you can just do a lookup on your deploy ID. So I just want to clarify, I don't think I made that super clear while I was going through the update. So it's another usability enhancement for our developers. Um, with that, I will turn over the tech or be done with the tech update and let you move on with the next stuff, Greg. I was just saying we should try probably try to recreate that uh, condition in no testing tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Oh, and I I just um, want to say one more thing, which is last Thursday no testing um, was actually really exciting because Ed, uh, who's been hitting this bug that we're talking about, got to do a complete walkthrough of his wallet against Testnet, and um, it was uh, pretty exciting to see for the first time, um, a dev written app interacting with testnet, uh, able to transfer rev from one user to another using his app. So uh, kudos to Ed for A for just um, um, sticking to building that um, is a great, uh, I think it's the first real app that's against testnet um, that's working. So uh, kudos to Ed on that. It's really awesome to see. We need more devs. Uh, doing the same with other ideas. Agreed, agreed, 100%. So uh, uh, we, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm glad the tech, tech update was, was so rich. I, 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 I wanna mention um, just one thing and then we can push other things to the Friday call. Um, I spoke uh, for over an hour this morning um, with uh, Apis Capital. And our, uh, our business development partner, Marcus Willems, uh, who is Luxembourg based and is, uh, uh, will be running um, validation nodes um, uh, for the root shard, uh, was also on the call. And the one thing that they said, uh, and they just kept pounding on was, we're now at a point in the market where there are over 20 uh, protocols that are all duking it out. Um, and uh, the venture community, by and large, is only interested if they can see that there's a, a, a DAP that actually makes money that runs on top of these uh, protocols. That He just said point blank. Um, the venture community says, come talk to us when you have real adoption on top of a DAP running on one of these protocols. Um, so I just, I just wanted to, uh, I, I just wanted to pass that along. That's, that's what he said. And, and Marcus, uh, Willems will confirm that's what he said. 
Um, and, uh, and, and this was the atmosphere that I was preparing for um, from the inception. I knew that there would be, there would come a time when the protocol part of the space would be quite crowded. And in fact, one of the things that I've, I've said since um, early 2017 is that we should be pushing towards uh, technologies that completely commoditize the base protocol. So that with a push of a button, you can generate um, a version of Casper that supports your favorite flavor of execution. Whether it's JavaScript or the JVM or, uh, or Rolang or whatever it is, um, you, can, you, you can essentially push a button and have, uh, have a base protocol layer uh, generated uh, from uh, the algorithms that Vlad and I have been working on. Um, which completely and utterly commoditizes the uh, the lower level protocols, makes them uninteresting because they are uh, there. In, in, anyone in their basement can can generate one of those, and pushes all the value to the DApps. Um, so um, the the venture community is already there, regardless of whether or not that part of the protocol is is commoditized or automated. Um, uh, they say they see that the space is crowded, and they want to see that there's actual um, value generation in terms of uh, DApps that can run against the protocol. So um, that's a direct um, direct feedback, and I have to tell you that this is not the first time I've heard this. This is the hundredth time I've heard this. Um, so, uh, I, and anyone who's done any sort of work with uh, uh, the venture community uh, over the last uh, five or ten years will understand that this is kind of their risk protocol or their risk uh, uh, um, assessment until they see actual commercial engagement on a customer facing application. Um, they are, uh, uh, they're not as likely to engage. So deploy I, or die. What's that? Deploy or die. Something like that, but it's more than just deploy. It's it's deploy and have users who are forking over cash for what you deployed. Um, so we're 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 back to uh, there. There was a blip in the market from about the end of 2016 to the beginning of 2018 where there was appetite uh, within some communities just for platform plays. Um, but prior to that point, uh, um, and Ed, Ed Eichholt can tell you this because we've spent many, many hours talking to angels and VCs uh, about um, uh, uh, wallet-like applications. Um, uh, the, the, the VC community by and large, they want to see that you've already got customers that you've already sort of crossed a certain risk profile. Um, 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 so customers who are paying for uh, services um, before they will put any sort of money in, into the mix. And then the other, the other thing that I think people need to understand is that um, Appis very, very much agreed with a B2B2C. Um, so uh, business to business to, to consumer. And that's exactly how they characterized um, the co-op approaching artists rather than end users. So their view was we were spot on with the strategy uh, to, to go to um, a business like Taylor Swift or, or Jay-Z or anyone like that. You know, so they already have a business. So it's cooperative to a business like that. And then those businesses who have customers, like Taylor Swift has millions and millions of listeners, um, that, that they, they would then turn around and do the heavy lifting of reaching out to those millions and millions of folks. It's not cost effective uh, for uh, the cooperative to attempt to do end user plays, uh, but a B2B to C kind of play is cost effective. So again, there was very, very strong confirmation directly from VCs um, of this strategy. And 
it's it's important to understand that this is not the first time we've heard this. We've heard this over and over and over and over again. So I just wanted to pass that along. Um, uh, and with that, uh, 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 get back to the, the business of deploying <laughs> before we die. <laughs> so is, what's your plan for uh, getting a hold of Taylor Swift or anyone else like her? How's that going to work? Um, well, mostly that's a network of personal relationships, which we have a, a pretty, pretty extensive, um, pretty extensive set of relationships. And it seems like a pretty steep hill. How much time is there to do that? Uh, actually, that hill is not quite as steep as you might think. Um, so, uh, but we seem to be we seem to be doing all right. We've got we've got enough uh, money coming in the door that uh, that we have we have the time we need to to get there. But uh, but I you know my response just so that people are clear, my response to the VCs as it has always been is, you know what, if we're at the point where um, we're, you know, making money from customers. We don't need you. We're not interested. So you have misunderstood the value proposition and the landscape. The issue has been that in the preceding decade, uh, it was okay for companies like Facebook and Spotify and all of these network effect companies to completely add edge out the people that bring the content, which is what's really valued. It was okay for Spotify to play millions and millions and millions of streams of Peter Frampton's work and pay him $1,700 for it. That was okay, right? And it was okay for Facebook to have billions of dollars per quarter in profit and the content generators and the content curators get zero percentage of those profits. That was okay in the preceding decades, but with the tokenization technology, it's now possible for those people who are participating in the generation of the valued content to participate in the profits. And so it's no longer going to be the same game. The game has changed. The, the, communities, can, the communities can put the money in and they, can, and they will do so because they will re reap the rewards because they can now participate in the reward system. And the whole micropayment structure that's necessary for that to happen is part and parcel of what the blockchain delivers. And so the economic game with respect to uh, uh, the, the, the growth uh, potential has completely changed. The issue used to be that if you were a WhatsApp, right, and you needed to do that next, that next level of growth, you had to go to a VC because it was very, very expensive to do that next level of growth. But now, if you are in a place where you have a million users and you're contemplating get to, getting to 10 million users, the capital... Um, the capital lay of the landscape has changed because all 10 million uh, or potential 10 million can become participants in the economic re rewards. And so you can raise a different, uh, a different class of capital because the participants can, you know, you, essentially you can, you can supercharge crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. And that's, that's how blockchain changes the game. And so the VCs, you know, who missed the blockchain, they the, were completely blindsided by blockchain. They will be blindsided by the next, the next wave. Um, and so, so helping them, you know, part of the reason we were on the call for so long, it was not supposed to be so long, but part of the reason we were on the call for so long is helping the VCs to understand that the risk profile has changed and they're not going to be able to be able to play the same game and they're going to miss it again if they don't if they don't look carefully at the risks um, they they will miss the opportunities again because the upside just you know i know many people were terrified by the crypto winter but the upside is coming and it's very very large now um, all right i i've i've gone on and on and on about this but uh, i just i did want to pass that along Yeah, and in getting there, I think that, you know, when the dozens of uh, 
artists we know who are not so famous put stuff on our chain and I can sponsor my son's great music that hasn't been discovered yet <laughs> um, uh, on the platform that the larger artists will see the content and um, and well, understand why they want to be part of it. Well, you're absolutely right, Jim. But but also, I, I, I'm not interested in focusing just on our song, right? That the, we're doing a platform play for a reason, right? There are lots and lots of digital asset management uh, applications that are enabled and enabled in just a few with a few weeks worth of work to get to at least to an MVP um, on top of the platform. So yeah. the ar the argument the argument remains the same. We can right. get we can Ned, get. To Ned is leading um, a, a new uh, uh, D app developer group where mm -hmm. we're taking a wannabes that uh, uh, may want to write things and we're beginning to prototype community and governance applications and we're looking at setting up work studies on the Archain API and direction the, the, and the framework, uh, the, the Arsong proxy. That's what I understand. That's correct. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. So with that, I'm going to jump off. Thank you so much to everyone for the call. Thanks again to Pavel and to Chris. And looking forward to talking to you.